the next the next uh, speaker is Felix, and I'm sure he will rock the stage. Thank you. Give him a big applause. Before I start, um, who actually already worked with Elasticsearch? Oh, some folks, okay. Well, actually, it's half of them. Have they evaluated Elasticsearch or is interested in using it? Okay. The rest is only here for food and drinks. <laughs> so that's me. I'm Felix. Um, I'm um, the CEO and co founder of a small consulting company, Ascara. My Twitter handle is Silicon. They have the same, and you're probably going to find me on the Elasticsearch IFC channel with the same handle. I'm a backend developer, ops person. I'm always a little bit on the border. Like sometimes I do the development, sometimes I, I, I kind of get to see the other side of the fence and roundabout developers and what ops people do. Um, I, I'm an Elasticsearch user since 0 10 something, so that's like six years ago. Quite years. Yeah, some, something around that. Back then when things were mostly broken, and now they're mostly okay. I'm one of the founders of the Search User Group in Berlin. Um, we meet every last Tuesday. We don't have a talk for this month yet, but we'll, we'll probably figure something out. So if you're in general interested in search, not limited to Elastic Search, actually, um, you're welcome. Um, the scope, what are we going to talk about today? Um, folks that already know Elasticsearch are going to see a lot of things that they already have seen. Um, we'll just basically talk about what Elasticsearch does do, what it doesn't do, where it is that. This is very often very interesting if you're researching a technology to actually see where it does it not fit. Um, not like MongoDB, we can do everything perfectly. I like asking about MongoDB. Um, and I'm just trying to give you the relevant Google keywords so you can research further. If you have any questions, ask. Um, I, I basically earn my living doing Elasticsearch, so I, I might be qualified to answer not all of them, but some of them. And to the daily practitioners, um, I'm going to gloss over a lot of details. Um, don't be angry at me. Most of the time I'm supposed to know better, but um, sometimes it's just way too far down the rabbit hole to actually really, really go there. So um, if you actually talk about Elasticsearch, a lot of people mention Elk or whatever it is named nowadays, I think XPAC or whatever. Elk is not enterprise enough. And they're, they're, they're not giving away the small little plush Elks anymore anyways. Um, and the other part is Logstash. And Logstash is actually fairly unfancy if you if you try to sum it up. Um, Logstash is basically a worker process um, that takes input events, very often long lines, processes them each one in isolation, and writes them to a data sync. The input is often log files, but can be any kind of event stream. Um, I've seen people that basically have their registration events processed by Logstash, whatever. Um, the data sync is often Elasticsearch, but very can easily be something like Kafka, InfluxDB, Graphite, or um, in that case, Carbon. And parts of what Logstash does right now will move to Elasticsearch in terms of, or will be part of the ingest node in 5.0. If you're actually confused about the name or the, the version number change, um, that Logstash basically jumps from 2 to 5, and Elasticsearch jumps from 2 to 5 as well. And sometimes folks ask about what happened to number 3 and 4. Um, the reason is they, they wanted to move everything to the same version number, so you can actually see that Logstash 5 works with Elasticsearch 5, works with Kibana 5. And Kibana was already at 4, so the next one was 5. That's the very undramatic explanation <laughs> of that. Um, Kibana is even less exciting. Um, basically, Kibana visualizes the result of single Elasticsearch commits. That's how you can sum it up in, in 
one or two frames. You can do a lot of things in Kibana, but in terms of software, if you look at what it does, it is not very exciting. <laughs> it's basically a browser plugin, or it used to be a, a, a pure JavaScript application. Um, that's all I, I actually want to say about the LMDK um, today. Um, if, if there's interest, we can do separate talks on those. <laughs> so let's get to the meat of it. What is actually Elasticsearch? Elasticsearch is a distributed JSON data store. I, I would like to avoid the name or the word database because that has a lot of connotations that are going to lead you down the wrong path. Elasticsearch is a data store and it's based on, on Apache received. What is it actually good for? It's very good for full text search, obviously, <laughs> because it's a full text search engine. Um, it is very good for timeline data, logs, and streams. Um, some people just use it as a fast data store for JSON documents. Um, that's something you can actually do with it. Um, and I've seen a lot of folks being very happy with it, basically trying to put it besides their MySQL database, denormalize the data in the form that they're going to, re going to reuse in their application. Um, and just feed the application from the Elasticsearch cluster. It's fairly easy to scale. Um, it's fairly easy to actually make redundant or failure safe, mostly. Um, and it performs fairly well in that role. Um, and that as a companion data store for some other NoSQL data store, for example, CouchDB or something. Um, the thing that it is not very good for is uh, primary data store in your system. If you, if you really are somehow emotionally attached to your data, keep it elsewhere, <laughs> um, or at least keep a copy elsewhere. Um, I know folks that basically use it as a primary data store, but they're like, okay, we might use a chunk, I don't care. Um, in a logging system, it's also fine to sometimes lose the same old log line or something. Um, there are edge cases that lead to data loss. Anything that requires transactions, it's not a transactional data store. Um, it's really volatile data. Elasticsearch is very bad at handling document updates. Um, very heavy write loads, it's not something that it shines as well. And anything that crosses a data center boundary, um, there is no cluster to cluster replication. And um, it is very much not advisable to have a slow link within the cluster because any query might at random times cross that link between the cluster and basically slow you down. And so uh, we have that off. This is what you should read and understand before you actually run a production critical classic search cluster. Um, I don't know whether you know the, the, the Jepsen test from Affire. Um, it's a fairly good read if you if you actually are interested in any kind of um, distributed system. Um, he, he does test distributed data stores, all kinds of, and let's put it blunt, all of them fail. Like all of them. Even Postgres, even Zookeeper, they all have edge cases where they fail. This is just something that is inherent in, in um, distributed data stores. It's just very important to know when your data store is going to fail and what are you going to do when it does. Um, the Elasticsearch documentation is fairly straightforward um, about their resiliency um, status. So when are you going to lose data? What are the edge cases where data loss may occur? They have a dedicated page to that. Um, that's the one in the middle. And the last one is actually aptly named Don't Touch These Settings. Um, <laughs> or at least don't touch them if you don't know what you're doing. Um, I've seen clusters um, when I do consulting that work about 50% slower than default. And most of them touch these settings. <laughs> um, there are ways to shoot yourself in the foot than any other body part. So exactly, how is it actually different from my skill? My, it's both data stores. <laughs> um, one, it is distributed. Um, MySQL 
except for the cluster version is not actually distributed, it is um, master-slave replication, so we have something that actually lags behind. Then we don't have tables, we actually have documents that are collected in indices. And indices are split into shards. Um, a shard is the smallest unit that we can distribute on the cluster, and shards are distributed and replicated in the cluster. I can add cluster nodes at any time, and the cluster will actually auto rebalance within some boundaries, um, but that, that's okay. And I can actually tolerate any node failure as long as I have one copy of the shard left. So if I have three copies, I can have two total node failures, and my cluster is just going to be fine, and it will reallocate new copies, and I don't have to do anything. This is actually something that works fairly well. Um, it's a JSON data store, so no tables, documents, all documents are JSON, all API inter interactions are JSON, and Elasticsearch by default will try and guess your JSON schema. You can tell it how it looks like, um, which is for production settings most of the time a good idea, um, but for development that actually takes a lot of the will. Um, it will try and guess, and then you can take that guess and refine it. Elasticsearch uses a lot of, or you see in the background, uses a lot of write ones data structures. That these files get written at any time. I have a timer here. <laughs> um, files get written um, once, and they get never touched again. Um, that is actually fairly efficient when you talk about disk buffering, um, working off spindles. Um, the scene was written in time when spindle disks were still the primary data store, and SSDs were something that people would dream of. And you can still see that legacy in a lot of places. Um, there is no in-place modification of documents, so no role level updates. Basically, every update operation is inserted and delete. This is why um, actually Elasticsearch is so bad when it comes to volatile data. Yeah, and it's shard. So queries cannot refer to other documents in other shards. So we can't do joins. The classic SQL join, select new documents where some value is equal to another value in another document. That's not going to work. No distinct queries. Um, there is limited support for parent-child relationships. How does it look in the background? On the last search of Lucene, a lot of what I'm telling is actually it does apply to anything that is Lucene-based. Um, Solar, for example, as well, uses the so-called inverted dot index. Um, this is, if we have those three documents, this is what the index is going to look like, or roughly. So we have a list of the terms that actually occur in the, in the documents, and then we have a list of document IDs where that actually, where that term actually occurs. Um, internally, Lucene tracks a lot more um, positions where does that term actually occur in the document, frequencies, how often does it occur, and stuff like that. But roughly, that looks like that. So we have the documents and. We basically need to get them into that format. And that is called, in Lucene speak, analysis. Um, actually, analysis is the process that determines which of the terms are going to end up on the left side of that table. Um, standard analyzers will be none, but we're just going to take everything as one term. Um, white space, yeah, we just split our text up. At any white space, then we can lowercase that, normalize it, that would be stripping off the diacrits and anything that was weird, and then stemming. Why do we do that? Because sometimes people can't type the U, sometimes people don't know whether that's capital U or not, um, and actually, I would like to find anything that is related to Folgen, whatever verb form I use. And that happens on indexing and queries. Um, so basically, uh, because I process the query and the index, um, the document at index time the same way, I'm 
in the match. Manipulating that is the basis for manipulating matches. So, um, for example, classic thing is um, if you do a full text search on a TV website and have show name and there is some name of some star, people basically never, never ever spell that right. They, they are going to forget about any other stuff. They are going to pull words together and by building an index that actually matches up to their expectation, I can still present them with good matches. And being able to actually do that is something that only a few systems provide. Um, Solar can, Elasticsearch can, and that's about it. Um, if we look at that beautiful character, that's a capital B. Ask yourself the question, does your system comfortably speak Unicode? <laughs> um, if we look at this, so three documents with just one term, um, we, we actually expect to get an index that looks like that. We have test and test, and they both get lowercase, and we have uberlin, and that should be normalized. And if we actually try MongoDB <laughs> and use these search terms, that's not, that's really not what we want. It doesn't match on you. Why that? That's because MongoDB says it can do full text search, but it can't lowercase Unicode characters. Well, actually it can ASCII, anything that is in the ASCII range, but it cannot do DataCrit. That one has been fixed in 3.2, <laughs> but it still does do language specific stuff words and things like that. And you ca cannot change the defaults. You can basically tell it it's German and then you're on the boat and wherever that boat meets you and if it's down the waterfall, MongoDB doesn't care. The, the recommendation that is given in the docs is pre-process your input yourself. And that one is the waveform of the sad trombone I didn't know what I had. Let's get a little more funky. Does anybody know these characters? No? That's actually an allowed way to write U and U in Unicode. That's basically the base character in ASCII and the diagrams on top. And that's where Postgres fails. It can do the lower chasing because Postgres doesn't actually do UTF-8. It does UCS2, which is a precursor to UTF-8. And their, <laughs> their stance on that is we should really reject that, but we can't because we know that we're going to break PC. And that's where we all sign and say software. <laughs> so if, you, if anybody here uses Postgres and text manipulation, you probably have a bug working somewhere around there. <laughs> and don't even get me started on this one. <laughs> <laughs> and Elasticsearch handles all of that, and it does it gracefully. And it does much, much more. This is actually a classic call. Um, you can use the Analyzer API to pre-process your data and actually look at what Elasticsearch is going to, to produce with that. And obviously, um, I can tell you the result of this one is going to be a lowercase, or well, actually, Uber. How do we do actually search? This has been all about, we, we, we just get that stuff in there. Um, there's this one, um, TFIDF, I don't know if you heard that. That slide is stolen from with Peter Weaver's talk about actually scoring in Elasticsearch. Um, you can use that as a Wi-Fi password or something, it's not guessable. <laughs> um, the basic idea is, um, the algorithm is called term frequency inverse document. So the basic idea is we rank documents based on how many terms do they actually match. More matches better, less matches not so good. Um, and we're going to weigh that. We're just going to use terms that are frequent in a document. So 
so that they occur more often relative to the length and attach higher scores to them. And we're also going to track how often do those terms occur in the whole image. Like articles, they occur everywhere. They're not a good search term. They might be a good tiebreaker if something is like on the fence, but they are not a good search term. So we basically attach a low score to them. Which leads us to the internal scoring function, which looks beautifully nice. And we see that TF and YF occurs here. Um, and there is some boosting and normalization, and most of that is something you might want to tweak at some point, but the defaults are pretty good. So search, in general, is all about relevance and combinations of relevance. So was the title in the map, and what was the match in the title of the document, or was it in the body of the document? Am I doing some book search engine and I'm looking for an author because a match on the author field is much more valuable um, than a match on, on the full text description because that might be about some, somebody else. And many systems can do that. They can weigh matches on individual fields differently. Postgres, MongoDB can do that. But they only support changing the weight at the index time. So every time I actually want to adjust stuff, I need to re-index all my data, which is kind of painful, and which makes it impossible to actually give the user control over that. The last search, I can change that at very time. So I can basically tell it on this. I, I, I'm, I'm looking for something in a given time frame, rank me something that is very recent, higher than something that is very old. I can do the same thing with geo coordinates. So um, the classic hotel search, look for a hotel in a given price range, um, rank me the ones that are cheaper, higher, and um, I would like to be in, in a circle or in, in, in a given distance around a certain point, rank me the ones that are closer to that. And this is something you can actually do. You can combine multiple scores and you can attach individual weights for that. And why are soft words bad? Um, something I alluded to earlier um, is phrase search. I actually have those two documents. And if I index those with German stop words, I actually get that index. And the if is a stop word. That's so often in German that a lot of document space or a lot of full text indexes basically filter that out. Um, for example, MySQL filters every word that occurs in more than half of the documents, which is very bad if you, for example, have a title of a website in there and it basically disappears. Um, and obviously, I cannot search the phrase if then anymore with that index because the if basically disappeared. So always applying stop words like MongoDB does is a fatal error. Scoring in general um, takes time and experimentation because search systems are not binary things. Um, a lot of things in IT are basically answerable by it works or it doesn't. And search systems degrade in, in very interesting ways. Um, faults may need to weird documents being at the top, top documents suddenly dropping through the floor. Um, you basically degrade quality every time you get your weights wrong, but it, it works. It still delivers results. So that is something that basically is very hard to test in an automated fashion. And very often, um, building the relevance model, what is actually relevant to what I want to show is the hardest part of the task. Writing that down in code and finding a system that actually supports that is very often comparatively easy because we actually, we actually want to balance multiple, sometimes contradictory requirements um, to actually achieve 
what is loosely defining as the best result. Um, and if you ask your project manager, um, given these 100 documents, what is the best result? They're like, oh, that's obvious. <laughs> and you're just going to sit there and say, okay, but I don't see it. Um, yeah. Where to go from here? Um, like I said, today, that's only a very basic, basic overview. Um, if there is interest, um, we can visit the individual parts of the nervous system, like Jibana, like Logstash. Logstash is a bit, uh, like I said, uh, Logstash might be a bit of a problem because um, a lot of Logstash things are very individual problems, let's put it that way, like um, that works for me, it might not work for you. Um, but I've been running a fairly large Logstash setup for the last one and a half years, like 60,000 documents or events a second, somewhere around four to five terabytes in just a day. Um, so I can actually answer a couple of questions about that. Um, we can actually, or I can answer questions about the deep dive, individual parts of Elasticsearch. Yeah. And that one is my thank you. There is there is time left. There is time for for questions. Uh, maybe I can start with uh, the first one. Go ahead. <laughs> um, is it? Uh, when I, when I insert a document into Elasticsearch with a uh, field title, and I put a integer to this field. So the JSON document looks like uh, it's an object with a title, and this, uh, ti this title is equal to one. Is it possible to insert a, uh, another document with uh, so, so basically something like that. Yes. With, yeah, exactly. And then I want to insert to the same index, to the same type, uh, a document with a with a title which is a string. Like Felix is the best elastic search um, expert in Germany. Well, if you did it right, yes, it's possible. <laughs> um, that is one of the pitfalls when you rely on auto guessing the document structure because the first guess is going to be this is an integer. Obviously, it looks like an integer, it walks like an integer. Um, that, that must be an integer. Um, so, and, so the first thing what's going to happen is it's going to guess that it is an integer. And um, document mappings, once they have been detected, are immutable. So I can't change that later to a string. So if I first get the string, then the integer document, that's not going to be a problem. I'm going to detect, or the Elasticsearch is going to detect a string. Um, an integer can easily be coerced into a string. Uh, all works. Um, so far, so good. Um, or the other way around, I can basically tell it to um, expect a string here. So that would be a classic case where you have to go to manual definition because you basically mix your documents. That is, by the way, an indicator that your application is not performing well because it emits documents that do not conform to a common schema which is a fairly common problem in, in document data source, by the way. Um, I'm actually uncertain how MongoDB is going to behave in that case if you try to put an index on that field. Um, that, that might actually work or be broken in interesting ways. Uh, so, is it, is it possible to omit that, that behavior? Well, what do you mean omit that? 
omit by prepara preparation something before inserting this document? Sure, you, you can basically define the mapping before inserting the document. Mm -hmm. So um, if, and then once you define the mapping to have the type of field as a string um, or as a string, that's not going to be a problem. Right? Mm -hmm. Because then when the index gets created with the mapping, um, it is known that this, this is supposed to be a string and then no auto detection will happen. So it's never going to be an issue. Okay, so if somebody would ask, is Elasticsearch a schema-less uh, data store? Would be a would this be a strict yes or rather look into the mappings direction? Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just let asking. Let, let, let me return the question: Are document stores really ever ever schemaless, or do they just have a merging schema that is not document anywhere? Um, so if you try to push that into um, into MongoDB and add an index that is supposed to be an integer, what's going to happen with your document that has a string field? Mm -hmm. MongoDB is going to barf, rightfully so, because you tell it index that has an integer, or as a geo point or whatever, um, and it is a string, and, and I can't do that. And it's either going to complain loudly in the log, that is the good situation, or it's going to crash, or anything else might crash. Try to force um, any data store to, to do something that is not etc. Mm -hmm. um, but in the end, um, every type, every index in Elasticsearch will have a schema. You don't have to manually define it, but you can't change it. Once it's defined, it's there. Either implicitly by feeding a document or um, explicitly by basically applying a schema. So it is definitely yeah, cool. I asked it because I ran into, into this issue. I remember when I was uh, that's a very classic question. <laughs> starting with Elasticsearch. So, yeah, that's a pretty nice one because it actually depends on the order of documents that you insert, and it's going to get very interesting when you when you basically have random document generated for test cases because it might fail in some, might not fail in other circumstances. And that's certainly a problem. Are there, any, there are any other questions? Let me run the mic. I'm preparing for a half marathon. <laughs> Good opportunity yeah. I have. Uh, I was uh, researching uh, ways of modeling uh, alert based on uh, uh, the log data, log data in the last search recently. I was wondering if you have any experience or um, thoughts or recommendations. The tools I looked at was Last Alert and uh, from here to Boston. And now if you're familiar, and each of these are having some advantages. Well, there is Watcher. I never used Watcher at this event. Um, there is Last Alert, which we actually used. Um, alerting based on Elasticsearch in, 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 a, in a logging. Probably have an elk stack somewhere there. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm not very fond of that idea. Um, Elasticsearch is not a stream processing engine. Um, you could probably hook into the hook into log stash. Um, otherwise, basically anything that does alert in Elasticsearch, like the last alert, basically just runs a query, and if that query returns certain documents, it's going to alert you, but that, um, that basically requires a lot of performance. Um, the, the other problem is that Elasticsearch is not exactly a real-time system. You can get close, but it's not a real-time system. So if I have to do alerting based on logs, um, I would basically use logs such as stream or logs into Kafka. So we have very good experiences with that. We use something like Lima or the stream processing engine at the other end that reads the same data. Um, so don't do I, I would not do it in the last search. It probably works for most cases, but um, for me it kind of feels like a system that was never meant to do that. I 
things. I was also like consuming Kafka and Rima, but that solves I would say a different problem. But that's uh, not a yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> okay. That's that's probably all for me. Hello. First, thank you for the speech. Uh, I have a problem using Elasticsearch, but um, only only one you mentioned in the beginning that we're using the Elasticsearch as a data store. We are pretty happy with the, with the search queries, uh, scoring, and so on. But we have a lot of updates during the day. And then um, one of the solutions we applied recently is deleting index, dropping index, and recreating it once again. Do you maybe know any other solution or maybe any other better possibility for that? Okay. Um, <laughs> the, the, the classic update problem. So basically what's going to happen if you update a document, it gets deleted in an old segment and a new segment gets created. Um, and sooner or later you want to free that list of space. So what, what's going to happen is Elasticsearch is going to read all the segments in the index write new ones, delete the old ones, uh, process is called merging. Um, when you recreate an index, you basically just get the fresh view, no merges. Um, that's something that people do that actually have timeline data. Um, that works very well. Um, dropping an index is an easy and quick operation. It basically deletes a bunch of files at some cluster state. That's done in a second. So if that works for you, stick with it. Um, the other option would be to force a merge at night. Um, basically, enforce that. Use the optimize API and try if that works for you. Um, that's basically the two options. Get more I.O. That's the business. Don't delete so many documents. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the, the answers. Um, I sometimes have to get them to that. Um, yeah. Yeah, hi, and thanks for the very good introduction. Um, I basically have a follow-up question for the first question. Sure. So you're not really trapped with the guest schema, right? If you start from scratch or then go into production or learn, hey, okay, that's an issue, um, you can define this schema and then start with like sure. a string, right? Yeah. You have multiple options. You can basically um, start with um, out or basically have it auto guess everything. That is the, the quick one that might break at random places. <coughs> um, you can define certain fields and have it auto guess the rest. That actually works very well for logging. Um, you could basically define all the problematic fields and let it auto guess the rest. Works. Um, you can basically say, um, I'm going to define a list of fields and ignore the rest, which works for a lot of circumstances as well. If you actually know which fields you are going to search, basically do that. It's going to keep your index size smaller because it doesn't index all fields. Um, so it's going to be faster, smaller index, faster search. Um, that's a very easy equation. Um, and we're not going to have any problems with the extra fields because they are not in the schema, they are not going to be in the schema and there can't be any conflict on that. Um, Elasticsearch will still keep the source around as you gave it. So you can still, when you retrieve the documents, you can read those fields, um, they're still there. It's just Elasticsearch is going to ignore them. Or you can basically um, use a strict option, say anything that doesn't match that schema, please reject. Elasticsearch is going to reject the back. So you're, you basically have a range of options there. So you get a, a, a quicker feedback to let's say, adjust the you know, schema. Or, or basically, um, if, if your application relies on um, a document must fulfill the schema, otherwise the application is going to have problems, you can use that and basically um, reject documents that are not that. Okay, that would be a violation. Not uh, like okay, there's something we learned we didn't know before. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you get documents in, in a schema or in a form yeah. uh, that are new and you didn't know about yeah. before, then I guess you have to adapt. It's, it's not sure, sure, sure. 
real violation to say that you have to stick to that. Well, uh, then that's kind of depends. If, if, if the documents are user provided and you expect them to be in a certain schema, that would be a violation. Yes, Basically, um, please user, that doesn't match what we agree on. Um, a common case when you expose APIs to clients, for example, like we expect that you, you, you feed us this data and if it's not there, we, we are going to reject that. Um, so that's that, that's a fine mode of operation for certain use cases. Um, sometimes it might be interesting to just see that in the logs, um, collect them, and you know, basically adjust your schema to match those. So you basically use it to detect um, diverging documents. Whatever suits you. Um, most people I know run with um, a CMA use um, configuration. So basically, they redefine a lot of fields that they expect to be there and um, ex accept every document that doesn't um, violate those fields. They might have extra fields and um, they basically need more extra fields. That works fine for practically all use cases. So this is the setting I would probably use. Thanks. Okay, and so question here. Hello. This question would be about Logos Dash. Um, I'm using Logos Dash for fetching some logs from Nginx and this all uh, Nginx access logs. Um, just uh, YouTube hosts, maybe 20 servers of Nginx running, uh, and I try to Grab some metrics from this block is especially error, and I try to use um, metrics filter in Logos Dash, um, and I know every every block entry in engine X error we have this status 500, uh, but I have problem when I switch it over the servers to this local, so every server have its own ID and its own host name, and it allows change over span. So I need to have some metrics about errors that happen in a specific course. I tried to use some dynamic metrics name, but uh, I don't think um, the stash metric filter support dynamic metric name. The documentation is that he supported, but you can easily define dynamic metric name, but if you have some dynamic tag or dynamic field, uh, it will not substitute this field from the evening and nothing. Um, that's a good question. question. I, let, let me think about whether I actually have that case. Um, but if the documentation says it works and it doesn't, raise a ticket. It's, it's just as simple as that. Um, you might, this is something very specific. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, it's very hard to answer without seeing the code. Actually, there might be an error in your code. Um, the generic um, advice I can give here is basically plot in the IRC channel or post something on the forum. The IRC channel is fairly responsive. Um, if nobody asks a few questions, just try again later because obviously time zones and people waking up and going to bed. Um, so, so the population in the channel shifts from time to time. But there are folks around that actually. Uh, another thing it is uh, I recommending some solution for alerting, for example, as asking about alerting. Yeah. Uh, I post this matrix to Promissive. Promissive is a uh, time series DB from SoundCloud. Yeah. Yeah. They have its own alerting manager that uh, can be created very easily with Promissive, so okay. it can be so What we actually did was um, for some things that could easily be done in Netflix, pushed out by a start C to graphite. Uh, Alert based on graphite type line. Um, that, what works to you? That, that works as well, but um, that is, that's a whole lot of setup around there just for alerting. Um, you can do that if you have those pieces around. Um, if you don't, I would actually try and evaluate a more or a simpler solution based on something else. Um, for example, you could go and if, if you just have one log stash process running, metrics plugin to count and then trigger on that there's an email output trigger email that might work. Never I actually never tested that practice but it might work. Thank you. Fine. Um, 
are any other questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, I have one more, like, uh, about stemming. Is yeah. there any sane way to handle, like, multiple languages? Ah. <laughs> um, basically, the, the heart of the problem is that stemming rules are different for every language, obviously. Um, like, um, we have three genders and how many time forms? Three, four? My wife is Polish, she always says we have nine. Um, so obviously the rules look different. Um, like, and you need to use an appropriate stammer for each language. So one solution is basically if you know the language beforehand, pass it in by using an appropriate field name, something like that. Um, so use documents that have one field per language that uh, works. Um, use different types, use different indices for different languages. You can actually query multiple indices in one go, so that is a solution that works. It has its own implications, um, every solution. <laughs> um, but that, that, that would be the default approach. If you don't know the language, then things get much harder um, because you basically have to guess it first. There are things that help you guessing the language, but um, let's put it that way, that, it, that is its own rabbit hole. Trying to also detect the language if you don't know it um, might or might not work, especially if you get languages that are close to you. So it's fairly easy to distinguish between German and Polish. Um, it's much harder to distinguish between the German dialects, if you actually really want to do that. Um, well, depending <laughs> on which dialects you choose, but yeah. Um, and, or between British and American English, you go enjoy. Um, that's all possible, but then uh, you're, you're fairly deep into uh, com uh, computer, uh, computational linguistics. Uh, I guess um, you have to find your own piece of software. Actually, Elasticsearch is fairly plugin friendly. So it's possible to write plugins that you can run in the Elasticsearch cluster and you can write your own scoring and analysis functions and stuff like that. Um, sometimes one pop out is to use a script. Um, so you can do scripting in the Elasticsearch process. That might actually work. Okay, thanks. Okay, if there are no other questions, ah, last one. Lots of questions. Hi. So we're just trying an Elasticsearch cluster at work. I'm just coming across some issues when we're having some nodes across different servers that have different resources, less RAM, less disk space, stuff like that. I'm just wondering, do you have to explicitly tell Elasticsearch how to handle where to put the resources, or is it smart enough to figure out how it does that? Let me put it that way, don't do that. <laughs> um, okay, um, I, I'm going to qualify that. Um, we tried that, we actually have servers that were the same except for disk size. So uh, Elasticsearch is very intelligent about that where to allocate charts um, and the service that reach a lower threshold, they're not going to get any new replica, and at some point they're just, Elasticsearch is going to migrate charts away. So it will try to keep your cluster in a working state. But um, if you actually start running queries on that, um, the clusters that have more disks are going to require more memory. Because some part of the data when you run a cluster um, is going to be loaded into memory and it's going to be persistent. View data is the key word there. Um, and some index handling data and some filter caches, and they're all basically persistent and they never get purged um, unless you tweak the configs and stuff like that. And so the, the, the um, nodes that have more disk will receive more shards because we were trying to use most of the disk, and all of a sudden they would run into memory problems ones with less this wouldn't. And it's very hard to get proper balancing unless you start manually assigning charts. 
So I'm not going to use that. It makes a lot, so I'm just going to push it onto a node that has more memory and more this and stuff like that. So if, if you want to rely on the auto balancing, it's best if your nodes are the same or if your data holding nodes are the same. If you have master exclusive nodes, you can size those for it, no problem. They're actually not that picky, but the nodes that hold the data should be the same or at least very similar. There are exceptions. There is some um, folks that use logging um, sometimes have problem code nodes. Um, code nodes are the ones where they push images that are a year old and never get touched. So they are part of the same cluster. They have more disk, most of the time spindles. They are much slower, but they rarely get current. And you can have rules attached to indexes that say um, this index should live on a cluster node that is tagged as slow. So you have two or three kinds of nodes, and you tag them. And basically, by changing the index configuration, you can move them around in the cluster. You still rely on the auto balancing for the individual node, uh, node groups, but you basically have an internal split in the cluster into two or three categories. So that works. But just basically saying, OK, I have three widely different nodes. I'm just going to put data on there. Um, that is going to be a major headache. So unless you know what you're doing, don't do that. Thanks. It, it's probably fine for testing. OK. Not a problem. Felix, thank you very much. It was a brilliant talk.